Welcome to this week's edition of Ask an MS Expert. I'm John Strum, and I'm the host of the Real Talk MS podcast. Each week, Real Talk MS reaches thousands of people in more than 100 countries around the world with the news that people affected by MS need to know. My wife, Jean, lived with progressive MS for 23 years, so I've had a front row seat experiencing all the ways that MS can impact a family. I'm a past member of the International Progressive MS Alliance Scientific Steering Committee. And currently, I'm a district activist leader and trustee for the National MS Society, and I chair the Society's California Government Relations Advisory Committee. The MS Society's Ask an MS Expert webcast is designed to give us a place for the MS community to connect and to connect you with experts who are ready to answer your questions on the topics that impact people affected by MS every day. Please feel free to post your comments and questions on Facebook, YouTube, or Twitch. MS Navigators are online throughout today's program, answering those questions and connecting you to resources. Today, we're talking with Dr. Alana Katz-Sand about the importance of a healthy diet and nutrition for people living with MS. Dr. Kat Sand is the Associate Director of Mount Sinai's Corinne Goldsmith Dickinson Center for Multiple Sclerosis and an Associate Professor of Neurology at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Every April, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Office of Minority Health observes National Minority Health Month to highlight the importance of improving the health of racial and ethnic minority communities and reducing health disparities. This year, the theme is Better Health Through Better Understanding. Today, we're focusing on building a better understanding around the importance of diet and nutrition and how diet and nutrition impact the health of people living with MS. But first, we're starting today's program with a special message from the Office of Minority Health. Hello, everyone. My name is Rear Admiral Felicia Collins. I'm honored to serve as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Minority Health within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Director of the Office of Minority Health within the Office of the Secretary. It is my pleasure to join you today. And I wanna thank all of the individuals who organized today's Ask an MS Expert program. For those who may not be familiar with the Office of Minority Health, our mission is to improve the health of racial and ethnic minority and American Indian and Alaska Native populations through the development of health policies and programs that eliminate health disparities. Every April, OMH leads the observance of National Minority Health Month to highlight the importance of reducing health disparities and improving health within racial and ethnic minority and American Indian and Alaska Native communities. I am so pleased to share the National Minority Health Month theme for 2023 is Better Health Through Better Understanding. This year's theme focuses on improving health outcomes for racial and ethnic minority and American Indian and Alaska Native communities by providing culturally and linguistically competent healthcare services, information, and resources. When individuals are provided culturally and linguistically appropriate information, they are empowered to create healthier outcomes for themselves and their communities. During this year's National Minority Health Month, the Office of Minority Health is partnering with the National Multiple Sclerosis Society to support increased dissemination of health information about multiple sclerosis or MS within communities of color. Not long ago, MS was believed to primarily affect white people. However, in the last several years, research has shown that Black and Latino individuals increasingly are being diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. During today's program, you will hear about the importance of a healthy diet when living with MS. I encourage you to ask questions to enhance your own understanding of the health information that will be provided today. I also encourage you to visit the Office of Minority Health website to learn more about National Minority Health Month. Our website address is minorityhealth.hhs.gov. 
That is minorityhealth.hhs.gov. There you can sign up to receive updates on OMH news and activities and learn how to follow us on social media. Thanks again from the Office of Minority Health for joining today's program. Now I'd like to welcome Dr. Alana Katzand. Thanks for being with us today. Thanks so much for having me. We all want to maintain overall good health, and that's especially important for anyone living with MS or any chronic disorder. Eating a well-balanced diet can certainly take us closer to achieving that goal. So let's talk about the relationship between diet, nutrition, and MS. Dr. Katzan, can you start us off by explaining the difference between diet and nutrition? People have different interpretations of, of these words, but I would say that in general, diet refers to the foods that you eat on a regular basis. And nutrition refers to the resulting nutrients that you provide for your body as a result of your dietary intake. How do the foods we eat impact our overall health? A lot of different ways. So we can think about the impact of the food that we eat on our health as both indirect and direct. So the indirect route is something that we already understand pretty well. And that really relates to the effects of a person's dietary intake on cardiometabolic factors. So things like obesity, cholesterol profile, um, conditions like diabetes and high blood pressure. And we know that diet has an impact on both preventing and also managing these conditions. And we have good research that shows us at this point um, that having these conditions comes with an increased risk of having worse MS. So it's important to pay attention uh, to these conditions. The direct route is really where we're trying to focus our research efforts um, because we think that's going to that's going to be what's going to help us answer questions about whether particular types of food can be helpful independent of the effects of diet on the medical conditions that we were talking about. So here we have to think about the fact that food is made up of molecular components and we need to be thinking about our foods the same way we think about medications for example with the ability to have a lot of different actions throughout the entire body. So metabolites that come from the diet act locally in the gut, and they also have an impact on organs all over the body, including the brain, and therefore they have the ability to have a really big impact on our health. Can you walk us through the connection between gut health, inflammation, and MS symptoms? So this is an area where the basic science research has actually already come a really long way in the last few years, and we're continuing to make more and more progress. So as uh, I just mentioned, the food that we eat gets digested into metabolites, and that's done by the cells in our intestine. But part of what enables us to do that is actually our gut microbiota, which are the bacteria that live in our gut. So the composition of those bacteria, so which bacteria live there, as well as the different metabolites that the bacteria produce are really heavily impacted by what we eat. And um, the dietary components themselves and also our gut microbiota, those bacteria, they interact with the local immune system in the gut, which is huge. So actually um, a lot of people don't know this, but about 70% of the body's immune system lives in the gut. So the interactions that happen there are really important in terms of determining our body's overall balance between things that are pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory in terms of the immune cells and the molecules that the immune system uses to communicate with our other organs. So this has effects all throughout the body, including inside the central nervous system, and that's where the relationship to MS comes in. We heard from Sean, who's wondering whether diet and nutrition can prevent or lessen your MS symptoms? So this is an area where we definitely need to do more research, but I think we've done enough now to say that yes, your diet can help lessen MS symptoms. So the studies have been small, but almost every published study on this topic so far, where participants followed a particular dietary intervention, and there are different interventions that people have studied, but almost every single one has showed a benefit in terms of MS symptoms, um, like fatigue, which can be really disabling in people who have MS. 
So in terms of prevention, uh, I think that's that's a bit harder to prove and that's something we're working really hard on, uh, but we do have some reason to believe that this might be the case and we're gonna keep working on the research. So understanding that a healthy diet can help manage MS symptoms, promote the long-term health of your nervous system and prevent other conditions, what does that healthy or balanced diet actually look like? A healthy diet doesn't have to look exactly the same for everyone. And it's not going to, of course, look exactly the same for everyone because we all have different habits and preferences and lives. But there are a few guiding principles that most clinicians will agree on. So I'm really fortunate to be part of the National MS Society's Wellness Research Working Group. We have a nutrition subcommittee and our recommendations are posted on the National MS Society's website. Um, so feel free to check those out. So what we, we can all agree on, although we all are researchers who are looking at different dietary patterns, but there are some guiding principles that we all agree on. So we recommend preparing meals at home when possible, um, limiting the intake of processed foods, which can be challenging, and, and we'll get into that a little bit more later, um, incorporating fruits and vegetables, which can be fresh or can actually be frozen as long as they're not highly processed, and then choosing whole grains rather than highly refined grains if you choose to eat grains. So those are kind of our overall recommendations. And if you, you know, work towards those, I, we, I think you're going to be doing a pretty good job. Researchers are continuing to make significant connections between diet, nutrition, and MS. So let's talk about the latest research and the work you and your team are doing. Cheryl wants to know if there have been any recent research updates to suggest a, a quote unquote best diet for MS. That's a question that I get a lot. Um, and of course, as clinicians, we want to always tell um, our patients that we're taking care of what we think is, is best. Um, I have to say we're making a lot of progress on the research front, but we don't have evidence to support a best diet for MS. And it may very well be that there's more than one dietary pattern that's very good for MS. And there also, I think, maybe personalized factors that we're gonna have to take into account in, in terms of thinking through recommendations. I think we can, at this point, they'll feel pretty confident in the recommendations that I just mentioned, um, because more and more research points to the importance of following general healthy eating principles for everyone, and particularly when you have MS. So I think that's that's the place that we start right now. Can you tell us what the MIND diet is and how it might benefit people who are living with MS? So MIND stands for Mediterranean DASH Intervention for Neurodegenerative Delay, which is a mouthful, but MIND works great. Uh, it's a dietary pattern that was developed by some of our colleagues at Rush, and it emphasizes foods that are thought to be good for brain health, and it limits those that are thought to maybe not be so good for brain health. It was developed initially um, for cognitive aging and Alzheimer's. And we know that while MS is, uh, is very different, of course, from those conditions, there's some overlap when you think about the pathology and you think about uh, the fact that MS really is also a neurodegenerative disorder. Um, so the mind pattern encourages the intake of foods like olive oil, nuts, fruit, uh, in particular berries, vegetables, and in particular leafy green vegetables. And it discourages the intake of foods like butter, processed sweets, um, processed meats, sugar-sweetened beverages, and, and things like that. And we think this may be of benefit for people who have MS. We know that, as, as I mentioned, there are these healthy eating guidelines. And of course, this pattern is very consistent with those. Um, we think these foods may be of benefit because from a hypothetical standpoint, they may help decrease inflammation. Um, these foods have antioxidant properties, and we think that some of them may have neuroprotective properties as well. You've led research looking at the link between dietary factors and brain structure in multiple sclerosis. What have you learned? A lot so far, um, although we have a lot more to do. So uh, the first observational study that we did to help us look at Mediterranean patterns was in our RADIUMS cohort. RADIUM stands for Reserve Against Disability in Early MS, and it's made up of 185 people who are living with MS who volunteered to be part of our study soon after they were first diagnosed. It's a longitudinal study, meaning that we're following people over time, and we're looking at risk and protective factors for development of disability in MS. 
So our participants volunteered to provide us with a lot of information on their health habits, their medical histories. They have had clinical examinations and research MRIs. Um, it's a big study to be part of, and we're very grateful for everyone's participation. So we collected really detailed dietary information, and that allowed us to calculate a MIND score based on the principles that we just talked about of, of the MIND diet, and the score ranges from 0 to 15. So the main finding of the study that we published, there were a few different things in there, and this is published work. If, you, if you'd like to look it up, um, you can find it if you, you know, Google a few of these words, and here you'll, you'll come across the study. Um, the main finding of the study is that we found an association between the mind score and thalamic volume. So the thalamus is a gray matter structure that's deep inside the brain and has been shown through other research to be the earliest structure that gets involved in MS in terms of loss of tissue, loss of volume. So the fact that we were able to find this association, so people who had a higher mind score had a better thalamic volume, in people who were very early in their MS was very interesting to us because it implied that following this type of dietary pattern may somehow be protective. Um, this is an observational study. It's a single time point. So that means, you know, this is an interesting finding, but something we need to do more work on before we can be certain that that's really the case. You heard from Ava, who's wondering if a relationship has been found between diet, nutrition, and MS disease course. So that's something that we are definitely going to continue studying in our radium study over time. Um, that study is not just limited to MRI findings, of course, but fortunately, the group that we evaluated in the study uh, was very early on in their MS. So we couldn't really look at, you know, clinical outcomes in that population at, at that point. So in order to study clinical relationships, we performed a study that where we use data that we collected from our patients who've come through our comprehensive annual assessment program that we're very fortunate to have at Sinai, which is run through our neuropsychology clinic and uh, directed by my colleague, Dr. Samowski. So our patients complete surveys about their health habits. That includes a dietary screener that allows us to calculate a Mediterranean diet score that is pretty similar to the MIND score called the METAS. Um, people also complete questionnaires about their MS symptoms, and they have uh, physical testing, cognitive testing. We recently published a study looking at the relationship that we found between the Mediterranean diet score and MS-related disability. So we used a composite measure. Uh, which is called the multiple sclerosis functional composite. People may be familiar with it as a tool you often will see in MS research. And it includes uh, results of three tests. And they were a uh, walking speed test, a hand function test, and a cognitive test. And what we found there, which we were excited about, was a really strong relationship between having a better Mediterranean diet score and having a better multiple sclerosis functional composite score. And what's really important about this work was that this was after we controlled for all the factors we can think of that might otherwise explain this relationship. So we controlled for things like age, sex, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, uh, which includes things about the neighborhoods people live in and their educational background, for example, um, body mass index, uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, other uh, health related behaviors like exercise and smoking. And so even after we kind of pulled all of those things out, uh, this relationship with uh, diet score and MS related disability was still there. So that was pretty exciting for us. You know, as you've already pointed out, there's a connection between our food choices and our overall health. What is that relationship between diet and wellness? And when we're talking about wellness, are we talking about just physical wellness, or are we also talking about emotional wellness? So diet is a really important component of wellness. And wellness really refers to kind of the overall health and sense of well-being. And the concept definitely refers both to physical and to emotional wellness. And I do think that diet has a big impact on both of these. So one of the things that we talked about earlier, for example, is that diet has been shown in several small interventional studies to be able to help with MS symptoms like fatigue 
and also to help improve mood in people with MS. Um, there are a lot of other health-related behaviors that also contribute to wellness, and I think it's particularly important that we make sure to address these in people who are living with MS. We are very, very fortunate at our center to have a patient wellness program, which I co-direct with our wonderful nurse practitioner, Gretchen Matthewson. And uh, participants in the program meet with one of our with one of our nurse practitioners for an overall assessment that is completely focused on their wellness. Uh, they talk about issues like managing stress and sleep. Uh, they meet with our dietitian, with the physical therapist talk about physical activity and exercise, and they meet with our social worker to discuss social and emotional health and needs. And this really allows us to focus on our patients as whole people, and diet, of course, is, is one piece of that. You know, not long ago, MS was believed to primarily affect white people, especially women of European descent. We now know that MS is a disease that can affect anyone, regardless of race or ethnicity. In fact, recent research has shown that people in Black and Hispanic communities are being increasingly diagnosed with MS. Dr. Katzand, are there any differences regarding diet and nutrition for Black and Hispanic people who are living with MS? It's a great question. Um, there aren't any differences in terms of our overall recommendations, but as healthcare providers, I think it's really important to recognize that because of factors like systemic racism, uh, historically marginalized groups are at higher risk of having medical conditions like the ones that we've talked about, obesity, diabetes, and high blood pressure. And those things can make living with a chronic illness like MS worse and would really benefit from dietary intervention. Um, at the same time, because of these same issues, people who are part of these groups may have a more difficult time implementing healthy eating recommendations. And this is because of, of all of these historic factors, things like suboptimal access to primary care, um, discriminatory housing process practices that have led to less availability of high quality grocery stores in certain communities and other inequalities. Um, there can also be cultural factors that should be recognized as opportunities rather than viewed as, as barriers. I think it's really important to think of things that way. So, you know, for example, um, you know, I was talking to a patient the other day uh, whose family really enjoys eating rice and beans. So instead of seeing that as something that's getting in the way, um, if you can make a recommendation to maybe decrease the amount of rice in the ratio compared to the beans and to substitute brown rice, uh, that was something we talked about as a way to improve that patient who was struggling with constipation and will also probably improve their blood sugar. So instead of just seeing something as, you know, oh, we can't change this because it's fixed and part of their culture, I think you have to, you have to be sensitive to that and try to see how you can use it to actually benefit that person. Um, I think it's really important to consider all of these factors when you're making recommendations. And I also think it's important to prioritize our Black and Hispanic patients for services like the wellness program that we're fortunate to have at Mount Sinai. As you just reminded us a moment ago, good nutrition can help prevent those common health conditions that can make living with MS more difficult, more complicated. Given what we know, why is it sometimes so hard to make the right decisions when it comes to nutrition? I think all of this stuff is really hard. Um, many of us have longstanding habits that are hard to break. Our environments are not set up to help us. A really big problem, and my family will tell you this is something I'm always talking about, is that foods that are high in refined sugars and saturated fats are truly addictive. They're addictive in the same way that things like heroin or, you know, and, and other drugs are addictive. Um, processed foods have been specifically designed by the food industry to make you want to eat more and more of them over and over again. So there's this deep uphill battle that we're fighting. Um, those foods are also convenient to eat, whereas eating healthier foods often requires more planning and preparation. Um, there can also be issues surrounding access, which I know is something we're gonna touch on a little bit later. Um, but, I, but I think the important thing to say is that all of these issues aside, hope is not lost. Um, I think with some education and some help and support that it's possible to move toward making better choices and really to make big improvements in diet quality. I've heard people use the term nutritional literacy, and I'm hoping you'll explain what that is and, and, and why it's so important. 
So nutritional literacy, uh, we define as the degree to which people are able to um, obtain and process and understand nutrition information and develop the skills that are needed in order to make good uh, nutrition decisions. So basically what we're saying here is that knowledge is power. Um, and I'm really hopeful for the future that education around nutrition becomes standard in schools for everyone. Um, an improvement now, I think, we, and, and we are making some progress on this, would be more education for physicians and other healthcare providers who usually don't get a whole lot of training on this topic, which makes it hard to expect us to be able to properly educate our patients. Um, for where we are now, it means we have a lot of work to do in terms of improving our knowledge about nutrition and practicing skills that we need to help all of us eat more healthfully. And to that point, can you share some practical tips with us for increasing nutritional literacy? Yeah. So if you want to improve your nutritional literacy, I would highly recommend spending a little time browsing some of the resources out there that provide good information about nutrition. Um, a really good one is nutrition.gov. Um, there are links there to a tool called MyPlate, which can be really helpful um, to learn about general healthy eating guidelines and figure out how to um, how to build your plate. That's why it's called MyPlate. Um, there are also links to recipes and other tools there. Um, but there are, of course, a few uh, general tips that I recommend. Uh, the first is to become a planner when it comes to meals and snacks. So if you spend a little bit of time to plan ahead, that's gonna make it less likely that you're gonna be out and stuck somewhere when you get hungry, um, which is when we tend to make suboptimal food choices out of necessity. You know, for example, if you know you're going out for a little while and you might be hungry based on the time you're gonna be getting home, um, put an apple or a banana or a peanut butter sandwich in your bag. Um, and that way you're not gonna be out and end up you know, grabbing a burger or a croissant or something that's not going to be as helpful for you. Um, so I think it's good to try to allocate a little bit of time uh, to spend planning your meals at least once a week so you can figure out what your grocery plan is going to be and um, make sure it's in line with other things you have to do and make sure it's reasonable with regard to limitations. There are a lot of limitations that we all have in terms of time and energy and finances. Um, if you go to a grocery store to buy food, uh, something that's important is to just take a moment and notice the way that the store is set up. So I always advise people to try to shop the perimeter of the store. So go around the outside of the store, stay away from the, the inside. The outside of the store is where most stores are going to keep their fresh foods. Um, and the middle of the store is where they're going to keep a lot of processed foods. So that's, I think, is a, a good, easy tip. Um, Specifically with regard to nutritional literacy, I think it's really important to read the labels on everything that you buy. So if you're looking at a label and there are a lot of ingredients on there that you cannot pronounce and you don't know what they are, it's probably not something good that you want to be putting in your body. I think that's kind of just a general rule. Um, another really great way to improve nutritional literacy is if you are able to, to meet with a dietitian. Um, that will be an opportunity to discuss issues that are personal to you and specifically to address your own barriers to healthy eating. Distance to grocery stores, lack of transportation, and low income are some of the reasons why people may not have access to healthy foods. How do these systemic barriers impact people with a long-term disease like MS? So, Access to healthy food is a topic that I personally am very passionate about. Everyone should be able to have healthy food to eat every day, period. This is even more important for someone who's living with a chronic illness like MS. Um, and I can't emphasize enough that food insecurity is unfortunately a really common problem. So the first thing I would say to someone who is struggling in this way is that you should know that you're not alone. And you should never feel embarrassed about asking for help. Everyone needs help at some point in their life with something. And so um, we need to recognize how important it is to speak up and, and to say something if you're struggling in this way. Uh, and there's really so much that can be done. So you can start by seeing if you're eligible for a government assistance program. Um, a program that people would be most familiar with is called SNAP, which is a Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Um, there are also particular programs that can help certain populations, such as WIC, 
for pregnant and postpartum women and young children. And these programs actually partner with grocery stores and farmers markets and are really working on improving access to healthy foods. I think in the past, these programs had a bad reputation for you know, favoring pro processed foods, but um, there really are a lot of great partnerships out there now that can really help. Um, most healthcare institutions will have an office, um, some sort of resource entitlement or advocacy program that can that actually helps people sign up for government programs that they may be eligible for. Um, so you can look to see if, if uh, the place where you get your care has something in place like that. And they can also direct you to more local resources that can help. Um, I would definitely recommend uh, bringing it up with your healthcare provider. Uh, there may be a social work office. A lot of uh, people who uh, take care of people with MS will have a social worker embedded in their office. But even if they don't, sometimes the institution will have a shared social work position um, and that person could help you identify local resources. So, for example, in New York City, um, we have several large food banks that focus on having really fresh items available and a lot of choices. Um, there are also community fridge programs. Um, we have programs here for people with limited mobility that will actually deliver fresh, healthy foods as long as they have a referral from a healthcare provider. Um, so your healthcare team might not know that you're struggling with food, and it's really important to tell them what's going on so they can help. Um, a site that I mentioned before, nutrition.gov, has a lot of resources. Um, if you look at the topic section, there's a whole section on food security and a lot of recommendations there. There's also a section there about how to make the most of your food budget. Um, and then lastly, I will say we are very lucky to be doing this program today uh, for the National MS Society. And um, the society's MS navigators can also help you to explore community resources and, and to just make your way through, um, through setting these things up. Well, you've shared some great information with us today, Dr. Katzand. What would you say are the top three takeaways that you'd like our viewers to remember? Yeah, so there's, I think there's so much, um, but a couple of things that I think are good to work on is one, if you're able to work on reducing your intake and reliance on processed foods, I think that's a really great way to start. Um, and the second that goes right along with that is to try to work on incorporating, replacing some of those processed foods with some fruits and vegetables as much as possible. And don't be afraid to use, to keep some frozen vegetables in your freezer. That's a really good way uh, to do things if you don't have time to run out to the store and, and grab something from the market. Um, and then lastly is the part that I was just talking about, which is to make sure that your healthcare team is aware of any issues that you have related to food and, and ask for help. Uh, that's why we're all here. Well, I want to thank everyone who submitted questions and thank you, Dr. Katzan, for being with us today. Thank to you. learn more about the Office of Minority Health and this year's Minority Health Month initiatives, be sure to visit their website at minorityhealth.hhs.gov slash nmhm. Before we close, I want to remind you that the National MS Society's MS Navigator Team is your best partner when it comes to connecting you to the very best information and resources on living with MS. You can reach an MS Navigator by phone, email, or through the Society's website by chat. For information and resources on MS, please be sure to visit the Society's website. You'll find research updates and news information on connection programs like self-help groups. You'll hear about ways that you can get involved and you'll find out about upcoming events that are taking place near you. Remember, you can connect with the National MS Society and others affected by MS on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. And I hope you'll join me every week on the Real Talk MS podcast, where I continue the conversation that we start here. You'll find Real Talk MS at realtalkms.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. I'd like to thank Dr. Kat Sand for joining us today. Please remember that a recording of this webcast will be available at the Society's website at nationalmssociety.org slash msexpert, as well as on Facebook and YouTube. 
I hope you'll join us at this same time for next week's edition of Ask an MS Expert. You can always find our upcoming program topics on the National MS Society's website. And now I have a favor to ask each of you. Getting your feedback on today's webcast is important. So if you're watching on Facebook Live, you'll see a link to a survey pinned to the comments section. And on YouTube, you'll find that link in the program description. Completing the survey makes a real difference. The information you provide helps us continuously improve, and it helps shape future programs. The survey takes just one minute, so I hope you'll take that minute to fill it out. On behalf of Dr. Alana Katz-Sand and the National MS Society, I want to thank you once again for joining us. Please stay safe and make healthy choices.